Well, please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. John chapter 17, the first five verses. You'll find that on page 903 in your pew Bible. John 17, and the first five verses, page 903. This is God's Word. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Amen. Let's pray. We pray now, Lord God, that you would open your word, open my mouth, open our ears, that these words might sink down into our hearts, that we might find in our Savior the fullness and blessedness of a salvation complete and perfect and sure, so that we may bring praise and honor and glory to your name. In his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, as Elder Mark Kirby mentioned earlier, the desires of our hearts are that which are reflected in our lives most frequently. It's the same, it's an invariable rule in our prayer lives, also that our prayer lives reveal what is most near and dear to our hearts. Prayer, after all, is a great revealer of what is in our hearts, what we desire the most. And here in Christ's prayer in John 17, it's no exception. We really do see what is nearest and dearest to our Lord Jesus Christ. As Manton said last week, I mentioned uh, that this prayer is a standing monument to Christ's love for his church. But there's one thing in this prayer which is more important even than Christ's love for his church. That is the desire that he might be glorified in order that his Father in heaven may be glorified. It's a remarkable prayer that his Father ought to be glorified by what's about to happen to him. In the shadow of the cross, the cross is but hours away. The pain, the suffering, the terror, the humiliation of the cross is before our Lord. And he says, Father, my greatest desire is that you should be glorified in this. And yet the interesting matter is, according to this text and according to the witness of the whole gospel, we understand that the glorification of Christ and then of his Father is actually through his cross, through the humiliation and suffering of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. But not just his cross, but also in his resurrection, also in his ascension back to the right hand of the Father. Son and Father are glorified. Our Lord reveals here in this text that his greatest desire while he is facing death is that in death and resurrection and ascension, he will be glorified so that his Father in heaven may also be glorified. We learn it's Christ's chief desire throughout his whole life. Christ's chief desire is to bring glory to his Father. There's a direct application to us in that respect to which we'll turn in a moment But we also ought to acknowledge that the means by which the Son and the Father are glorified are through apparently weak and foolish means. The means by which Christ and his Father in heaven are glorified here, firstly, is the cross. The cross. Through weak and foolish means, God is glorified glorified. That again is also instructive and strengthening for us. 
I want to do three things this morning with this text set against the backdrop of what I've just said. The first, I want to look at the structure of the prayer as a whole in John 17, and then the structure of the prayer briefly in verses 1 to 5, and find out what the significance of the structure of the prayer is. Then we're going to look in the first three verses at how Christ is glorified in life and in death, and then secondly, how Christ and his Father are glorified in exaltation. We're focusing then upon the glory of Father and Son in and through the work of redemption. And so look first of all then at the structure and the significance of this prayer. Uh, There are various ways to divide this prayer up. You read many different outlines that theologians give, but there's a generally accepted one. In the first five verses, Christ is praying mainly for himself. Verses 6 to 19, Christ is praying for his disciples who are with him there. And then in verse 20, you'll notice he says, I do not ask for these only, my disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, the expansion of the kingdom in the new covenant, Christ prays for the church. He prays for himself, his disciples, and his church. There's not three prayers here. There's one prayer. One prayer with three distinctions. And the glorification of Father and Son is at the head of this prayer. And what will bring about the glorification of Father and Son? It's Christ having completed his work. On what basis then will Christ pray for his disciples? And on what basis will Christ pray for his church? It's on the basis that he will be glorified having completed his work. He will be glorified having completed his work. Is there a more sure and certain foundation upon which Christ could pray for his disciples and for the church that he and his Father in heaven will be glorified and that he has accomplished his work? That, brethren, is indeed a sure foundation. Your lives as Christians are set against that great backdrop, Father and Son glorified in the work of redemption. We'll return to that in a few moments. But then we'll have to ask, we have to ask, can we find an outline in the first five verses? Actually, our Lord speaks in a very stylized fashion, and it's a very important way of speaking. Imagine, if you will, two sets, two flights of steps moving up to a central platform. So imagine that before you now. What we have here in this text is what's called a chiasm. It's a, a set of repeated themes. Look at the text with me. The first theme, the first step, if you will, on both sides is time. He says, the hour has come. Verse 1 And then in verse 5, the corresponding theme, he says, glorify me with the glory that I had before the world existed. Time is the first theme. The second theme is the Son's glory. The hour has come, glorify your Son. Verse 5, and now, Father, glorify me with the glory which I had before the world existed. Time, the glory of the Son. What's next? The glory of the Father. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, verse 1. Verse 4, the corresponding theme, I glorified you on earth. Now, where is this leading us to? It's leading us to the significance of this prayer and this passage. The significance is, is, if you will, that platform, that central section of themes, verse 2 and 3, eternal life. How will the Son be glorified? How did the Son glorify the Father? It is through granting eternal life. Verse 2, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life. Verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is at the very center of this first petition uh, in terms of the themes. What's going on here? There's great significance and relevance for us. Father and Son will be glorified in and through the work of redemption. Remember God's eternal plan that ultimately Christ would come and take flesh, uh, live and die for sinners such as we, be raised from the dead and ascend back to the right hand of God. Jesus is now saying, it's done. 
even though he hasn't yet completed it, he says in verse 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Having accomplished. It's a fact. It's done. It's a done deal, our Lord is saying. There's a sense in which this prayer... For the glory of Father and Son through our redemption is, if you will, a sign and seal that the great work committed to Christ has been done. Now, assuredly, we see that in uh, in death and in resurrection, but here Christ is praying with a confidence. These things have happened. I have glorified you. Now glorify me. Cast your mind back to John chapter 12. This theme of the Son being glorified even in death and the Father being glorified and its implications is right throughout John's gospel. Chapter 12, some Greeks come seeking Christ. And Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He's going to be glorified in death. Very important point. He then says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. He's laying out the paradigm of what Christian discipleship will be like. That his suffering is in some way a pattern of our own suffering and experience. If anyone serves me, he says, the Father will honor him. There is blessing, there is glory, there is reward for following Christ. He says in verse 31 of that same passage, Now is the judgment of this world. He's speaking about his impending death. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Notice this, the constant theme of my hour, the time of my death. It permeates John's gospel. But the second thing our Lord is saying there in John 12, 31, is that by his death, He will be glorified, and Satan will be cast out. He's speaking about the destruction of the power of evil, which he does incrementally, one time at the cross, and progressively all the way through to his second coming. But did you also notice what his death will also accomplish? And we, brethren, are living testament of the veracity of what our Lord said. He will draw all people unto himself by being lifted up, He will draw people unto himself. He has drawn us here today, has he not? He has drawn us to himself and here today that he may be glorified in our midst. The relevance should be obvious. Through the gospel, which affects us in this way, we are delivered from our sins. The Father and the Son are glorified. The glorification of Father and Son in John's gospel are inextricably linked to our Lord's death. The glory of Father and Son are also inextricably linked to the destruction of Satan and also the gathering of people from all nations, the salvation of sinners. We know, do we not, if I can put it this way, the great achievement of God not a terribly felicitous way of speaking, but the great achievement of God is his own glory, is it not? It's his own glory. Isaiah 48, verse 11, he says, speaking of salvation and how he'll deliver Israel, for my own sake, for my own sake I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. I'm reinforcing the point that through our salvation, God is glorified. We're going to get somewhere with this in a moment. The same is said in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go down to verse 5. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. The glory of God is of paramount importance to God. Father is glorified. The Son is glorified. Might I then suggest, brethren, that when our Lord is praying here for glorification, for himself, for his Father, when he prays for his disciples, when he prays for the church that is yet to come, those who would believe, 
that he could not be praying for a more sure and certain thing. When he prays that God will keep the disciples, when he prays for the unity of the church, that the church will be blessed as he will later on, he is praying for a certain thing. Why? Because that glorifies God, and there is nothing more certain in life or death than God will be glorified. Christ has an individual relationship with the Christian, a relationship with the church, with his disciples, and he is praying for them to the Father that they will be kept, they will be sanctified, they will be united. And that will bring glory to God. I would suggest those prayers needs must come true. They must be answered. There can be no way that Christ's prayers, as if this were possible anyway, could prove false. Because these petitions are bound up with the glory of God, which God will achieve. And so I think, brethren, we have a window into the workings of the mind of our Lord and the purposes of salvation. Practical application to us now. I would hazard a guess that most of us think of salvation in terms of what has been done for us. Now, some of us might need to think more about what has been done for us in salvation, but I would suggest that is not the chief focus of salvation, what has been done for us. The chief focus of salvation is how it brings glory to God. The salvation of sinners is that which brings glory to to be God, to, to God. Condemnation of sinners also brings glory to God. God's justice, God's righteousness is magnified in the condemnation of those who do not repent. But how much more is God glorified by the salvation of a sinner? Not just his righteousness and justice, but his love, his grace, his mercy, his wisdom revealed in providing a way for wretches like us to be one with God through Christ. God is more glorified in redemption than he is in condemnation. Brethren, that's an application for us now. Our salvation is perfectly secure. Why? Because it's tied up with the glory of God. That's not a blanket statement which gives us excuse to be lazy, to be sloppy Christians, to live in a way which does not uh, manifest our profession of faith. We know better than that. I want to speak to you if you have doubts about your, your salvation, you have questions over assurance, whether your sin ensnares you, and you doubt whether Christ has saved you. If you're saved, you're saved. And it cannot be any other way. Because your salvation is inextricably bound up with the glory of Father and of Son. And God will not give his glory to another. Salvation is secure. Your salvation. In those moments of doubt and questioning, when you feel that God has perhaps departed from you, you need to remember that your salvation is bound up with the glory of Christ and the glory of God Almighty. And that includes, brethren, not just our justification, our righteousness, but it includes our sanctification. I assume, like me, most of you struggle with ongoing sin in your lives. And sometimes that sin overcomes you, and you feel distant from God, or perhaps you feel you have no relationship with God. Your sanctification is bound up with the glory of Christ and of the Father also, because sanctification is part of salvation. I'm reminded of what John Newton said, I am not what I ought to be, I am not what I want to be, I am not what I hope to be in another world, but still, I am not I'm not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. That is tied up with the glory of God. And your struggles against indwelling sin, which continue daily, are also bound up with the glory of God. We are not what we used to be. Praise the Lord 
for that. But another application of this prayer is through the means by which Son and Father will be glorified through the cross, through death and resurrection, is that one of the great preoccupations of Christ is the salvation of sinners. That is the means in this text by which Father and Son will be glorified. The salvation of sinners. Ought that not to be our great preoccupation also? Ought we as God's people, we who've been taken from the pit of death and sat upon a throne next to Christ, ought we also of all people, Of all Christians, we who believe in the sovereignty of God and salvation, the grace and mercy of God in salvation, ought we not be those who have the chief preoccupation with the lost, with those who are perishing? We can't save them, can't regenerate somebody else's heart any more than you can regenerate your own heart. But we can pray and we can live well And we can speak well on behalf of our Lord Jesus when we are given the opportunity. And so what we have here is the theme that Father and Son will be glorified in and through the work of salvation. And I want to suggest to you that verses 1 to 3 speak about glory in Christ's life and in his death. Let's look at that very briefly before we turn in verses 3 to 5 a glory in Christ's exaltation. We have here in verses 1 to 3, uh, the glory revealed in Christ's uh, life and death. Uh, one reason why the Christian faith is so unpalatable, and there's many reasons, so unpalatable to the natural mind is that it turns the world upside down. Victory or glory is achieved through personal hard work, through endeavors, through strength, through assertiveness, often through oppressing others. Not so with the cross. Not so with Christ. This is why the message of the cross, as Paul says, is foolishness to them that are perishing. It's a despised means. There cannot be, for the natural mind, glory in someone being nailed to a tree, especially if he's calling me a sinner while he does it. But you, dear Christian, you've been granted a new heart. You've been granted new eyes, the eyes of faith, not just the eyes of flesh. And you can see that apparent weak and cursed means often bring about the power and glory of God. Do you know that lesson? Do you know that reality in your own life? Again, I would hazard a guess we spend... Much of our time and I guess most of our lives having to teach and reteach ourselves this reality. The struggles and trials and torments of this life are in no way antithetical to God's powerful working in your life. On the contrary, frequently that is the very mechanism God uses to work in your life. That your troubles, your sorrows, your hardships, which can be great and many, are in no way working against the power of God Almighty. In fact, he is working in them and through them. The cross is the most perfect example of that, which is what our Lord is speaking of here. He will be glorified. He says his hour has come and he will be glorified. Here is the focal point then of Christ's ministry, the hour. He spent the whole gospel saying, my hour has not yet come. And now he says the hour has come. They're not just words. He's speaking and living in the shadow of the cross. They're going to flog him. They're going to spit in his face and mock him and then nail him to a cross. And he says, Glorify me. Glorify me. He's going to bear the unimaginable weight and anguish of separation from God, forsaking by the Father. And yet he confidently prays, glorify me. He's going to be glorified in being revealed to be 
who he has said he was all along. Everything he has said about himself and his work are going to be proven true at the cross. He is going to be the obedient Son of God, who, though sinless and righteous himself, will voluntarily take your sins and go to the cross for you and for me. Adam failed as a son. Israel failed as a son. Christ now comes and says, I will be glorified in being revealed as the true, obedient, yet sin-bearing, cursed son of God. And he does so voluntarily. That's the only thing in this whole dynamic which stops it being a miscarriage of justice. Somebody suffering for somebody else's sins would be a miscarriage of justice unless the the volunteer takes it upon themselves to do so. Brethren, do we not see the honor of Christ here? The nobility of his mind and of his thought, his sacrifice, his love, his devotion to God and to you and to me? Do we not see these things? This is his glory, suffering and obedience, suffering and obedience. As they were for him, they will be for us, preludes to eternal life. This is what will bring glory to the Father, as he says, glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Christ self-consciously approaches the cross with the mindset, I will bring glory to God whatever the cost, as long as I do it righteously. Whatever the cost. The Father will be glorified by the Son revealing who the Father is, His justice, His unimpeachable righteousness. And His death will reveal that. It's an old saying, if you want to know what God thinks of sin, look at Jesus on the cross. That's what God thinks of sin, our sin. And what he thinks of his children, look at Jesus on the cross again. There is the mercy of God, the grace of God, the kindness, compassion of God to his children revealed. That God loves us enough to put his son on the tree. That's the love of God. Are not the Son and the Father glorified? And this is how they're glorified. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Here we have Christ saying, my hour has come. Son and Father will be glorified in the moment of his death. How? Through his death, he will grant eternal life. How? Verse 2, because the Father has given him authority over all men to give eternal life to whom he wills. He's given authority over all men. All authority, Christ says earlier, has been committed to him by his Father in heaven. And here he is saying, in order that to some, not to all, He may give eternal life that God has given him through the power of a righteous life and a sin-atoning death, the power over death itself, the power over sin in our lives ultimately and progressively. We have power, Christ has power over our lives. And he's done it for all men. We need to understand that clearly. To all whom you have given him. All flesh. It's not every single person will be saved. We know that's not the case. But it's over every kind of person. From every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. To give them eternal life. He defines eternal life there in verse 3 very clearly. They know you, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. In other words, brethren, you cannot have eternal life unless you know the true God. And unless you receive Jesus, whom the Father has sent. Now, now you might think that's terribly reductionist. Well, I just believe in the Father and I believe in Jesus. Yeah, I believe. (laughs) What you see here is the tip of the iceberg. 
To say you believe in the Father and the one whom he has sent is to say, I believe what the Bible teaches about Christ. I believe what the Christ says in the Gospel of John about himself, the very things the Jews rejected. I believe them. I receive them. I'll rest my eternal life upon them and upon him. You see, this is not just mere intellectual fancy. It's not about how much you know in that sense. Knowledge in and of itself is not a bad thing. But this is about a saving acceptance, a saving trust, a willingness to say, in Jesus' hands, I readily place my life. I readily place my life. Two matters, brethren. If you're a Christian here today, have you placed your life in the hands of Jesus? You might think that's a question I ought to ask those who don't believe, but I'm asking you. Because the truth is, as I mentioned earlier, we spend a lot of our time putting our life in our own hands. Living our life according to our wisdom. Finding things that we think will satisfy us eternally. And it's not working, is it? It's not working. Those things that we put our trust in or we find our fulfillment in, they're broken cisterns. You're lifting up a jar of water to your mouth and it's got a hole in and the water's pouring out there and not down your mouth. You're not quenching your thirst, are you? It's the idolatry of which has been spoken previously in this service. We lift up things far too close to our eyes and we fill our vision with them and we lose sight of the glory of God because the glory of God is not just some abstract idea out there. It's about your very well-being today and tomorrow. And when you lie on your deathbed, the glory of God is about your deathbed. The salvation of sinners in life and in death. Are we putting our hands, are we putting our life in the hands of Christ? And what about if you're not a Christian here today? And you've come to God's house and you've not bent the knee to King Jesus. You're living in whatever illusion you are thinking you know best, are you really foolish enough to put your future in your own hands? Really? You're not guaranteed your next breath, and you would commit your future, not to mention your eternal future, to yourself? The glory of God will be manifest in your lives if you stay on the same track. And God will be glorified in your condemnation to an eternal hell. But there's a better way. It's the way of the cross. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Saved from the sins that separate you now. Saved from future sins that you will commit. That you might dwell eternally with Christ. But the glory of Christ, very importantly, does not end at the cross. He's not like some warrior fallen on the field of battle whose body remains there but gets some uh, award or medal posthumously. No. Christ's glory is of no use to us if it stops at the cross. It doesn't. It goes to eternity. And that's what he says in verses 3 to 5. And I'll be brief on this. There's glory in Christ's exaltation. Not just in his death and in his life, but in his exaltation. He says there in verse 4, I glorified you on earth. We're coming back down the steps now, as it were. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. He says, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. He's done it, as good as done it. That's what he's saying. And he's saying, I did bring glory to you on earth, and now bring glory to me. Not the glory of my death, not the glory of my crucifixion, but the glory of my resurrection 
and ascension to the right hand of the Father on high. He says a difference between the petitions to glorify him in the first part and the second part. One is in life and in death. The other is in eternity. It is in exaltation. We're reminded then, are we not, by these words that our Lord, because of his love for the Father and his love for his brethren, set aside his glory. The Apostle Paul uses the words he emptied himself, not of his, his deity, not essentially, but the glory that comes with that deity he set aside. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, veiled the incarnate deity, Wesley. Veiled. He was, to use another Wesley analogy, contracted to a span. He became man. True man, real man. And his deity, though visible, was in a sense veiled. Jesus is now saying, I've done my work. I've done my work. Return to me then all that glory that I had with you before the foundation of the world. Who does John want you to know? He wants you to know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And believing in him, you may have life. If you simply believe that Jesus is the Christ and not the Son of God, you can't have eternal life. That's insufficient. That's not the Jesus of John's gospel. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. No, the fact that Christ is saying, Give me back, return to me, reveal fully, in a sense, all that I had before the foundation of the world is another great assurance to us as Christians. His glory is returned, fully revealed in his heavenly session as he sits at the right hand of God. The fullness of the glory of the Son is once again revealed. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father. We have here then, brethren, in the glory of Christ in time and eternity, in the glory of the Father in all things, a sure and certain hope of salvation. His moment, Christ's moment of earthly shame, paradoxically, is his earthly moment of greatest glory. But there's more glory to come also. He has finished his work. Your salvation is done and dusted. You will be kept. Though you struggle daily, Though your heart at times, and my heart can be like the unregenerate at times, filled with all manner of wickedness, God has provided a way to keep us. That's what Christ prays for the disciples, that they'll be kept, that they'll be sanctified, that we'll be united as God's people. You see, to you has been revealed the one whom God sent. And if you've received him and you've received the Father who is in heaven, then salvation is yours. And that cannot be lost, else the glory of God would also be lost. What we have here is Christ's glory and the Father's glory ultimately bound up with our own glory. Verse 22 of the same passage. The glory that you have given me I have given to them. Do you see, in a sense, glory here of Father and Son is the great assurance of what God has, is, and will do for us. And so, brethren, as God has glorified us, may he be glorified in and through us. Let's pray. Indeed, we would glorify you, Lord God, not just in song, not just in the moment, not just in our next hymn, but, Lord, all the days of our life. Help us then, Lord God, eradicate all doubt, all questioning about your good intentions towards us. And help us then, Lord God, eradicate all sin that, that ensnares us and tempts us. And help us, Lord, when we have fallen 
to humbly return to you in repentance and receive that fullness of joy restored. For with you there is peace. With you there is joy. We praise and we magnify you, our triune God, in and through Christ. Amen.